Okay, well, there's the margins. That's uh, 43 minutes of sailing on board uh, that so far since the race started, and uh, a nice little lead for Sanya as they begin to head out. This is the again, this one of the big long wharves looking out across the harbour, packed with spectators. I think uh, they were estimating something over a thousand boats out yesterday. I suspect there might be even more yesterday. People taking every vantage point to look out across the city and across the harbour to watch these guys heading out. And I think most people here know that what they're heading out into is, <laughs> is going to be something very, very rugged. So the boats, you see, we heading towards North Head. Still punching tide. It's going to take a little while to get out of the harbour, get the relief from the tide, but. Camper up to windward, Telefonica down to Lloyd here. There's on board Camper. So the, the headland there that we're looking on, that's where we're based, North Head, which is the iconic headland. There's the massive crowd up on North Head enjoying festification, really, isn't it? The today and yesterday, really, there was a lot of people up here enjoying the day, binoculars, the New Zealand sailing public, pretty educated out there before Martin and they ask the questions they know the technical terms well that's where we're broadcasting from now that's one of our towers the orange tower there up on uh, there's two towers you can see there on on North Head looking back uh, down onto the city as Telefonica puts in another tack now I think uh, we might be heading over towards Camper and I think we might have a jumper. Oh, well, no, who have we got going first? Well, we've got two jumpers here. We've got... Uh, Alec Barker. This is uh, Dean Barker standing up at the back, putting his wife and putting his sunglasses away. And in front of him is uh, one of our TV presenters getting some... Uh, there she is. This is Tony Street, the sports presenter, one of my colleagues, actually. And uh, she's about to do the leap. And she is, uh, she's a game, a very game girl indeed to be giving this a go, but she does have a bit of heritage here in that she's, uh, she was a surf okay, lifesaver as uh, from, she's from New Plymouth on the west coast of New Zealand. And they're just waiting to see which way they're going to go. And then they've gone back over to the other side. Maybe they're having a little bit of a pause before they do the jump. Oh, uh, well, I think the issue was... Don't, uh, oh, we've Martin. got Telefonica coming across. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, a big blue boat coming through and... Uh, yeah. That could have been a little bit, uh, a little bit iffy. So they've uh, had a, a little change of plan. We'll come back to that when we can, uh, when it's going to be safe for the jumper to jumpers to jump. And this is, uh, yeah, it, it's well. You can see it's pretty confused out there. Lots of spectator boats. But behind them is the uh, Evans Team New Zealand chase boat that'll be picking up um, uh, Tony Street and Dean Barker when they do eventually get to do the jump. Well, the spectator boats. Oh, look at this now. This is. Uh, I mean, they're going to have to. Well, that's a bit of an issue of the for the, the boats the getting uh, people getting off because uh, you're always at risk in the water, and there's so many spectator boats out there. I'm sure, especially Dean Barker, he knows the lie of the land out on the harbour. They will not want to put anyone in danger, but uh, you have to be careful on board camper Tony Ray on the main sheet. Uh, this, is, this, this is, yes, it, it, it is difficult. I, I, I jumped off a boat, one of these boats in, in Wellington. And your big concern is that the boat that's picking you up suddenly looks absolutely enormous, and you know that you're just a little dot. <laughs> nice lay line in by the water. Sanya yeah, very there, nice by Sanya coming around the, the top of North Head here. And of course, uh, there's a lot of boats following Sanya, which means the boats behind are actually uh, getting affected by. The power boats ahead. We look at uh, Camper. They pretty tight ley line to get round North Head. Now they'll be punching tide. A lot of current. That's uh, Rangi Toto in the background. Uh, iconic volcano. Extinct, of course. One of uh, one of many volcanoes dotted around Auckland City. We're looking right now back right across the harbour and. I think it's going to be another tack. Well, that's an interesting one for Camper. I think Nicholson was trying to lay around the end of uh, North Head, 
but they're setting up to tack. So this will be uh, just a little bit costly for Camper to have to clear. We can see there's a lot of spectator boats. There's North Head there. So uh, Camper. This will be. will be expensive. Mark, whereabouts are you at the moment? Well, I uh, am on the camera boat looking back at those shots you were receiving a little while ago. And all I can see is bow wave after bow wave. The water is chummed white with spectator fleets. And camera was right at the middle of it. It really is incredible. And we're just about to see Tony Street do her do her jump, I think. This is uh, when she gets the word. No, well, they're 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 again. Again. they can't. Uh, there they're are concerns, you know, with uh, all these spectator boats around, uh, getting people off, keeping people safe. It, uh, it was... Chris Nicholson there that um, called. He wanted. He didn't feel, feel comfortable about the boats getting off. Well, it's uh, it is uh, it is an issue here. There's such a mild well, storm being created. There's here. a dip here on Camper, which means they have to uh, go down below uh, Telefonica. We saw Telefonica tack away, and behind Camper. So Camper have actually lost a spot there. Uh, as they come around North Head. But I think more the point is you do not want having people in the water when you're, you're in close contact with the other racing boats. Safety, paramount. And I think uh, it'll be, maybe they'll just wait a little while till they've absolutely got it clear before they let anybody get off. Another complication for these guys, and I think that in many ways they're going to be glad when it's just the open sea that they've got. Chris Nicholson looks back. I think I wonder if they'll wait for one more tack before they uh, they let the guys off. We shall see. Now, Mark, you're saying that it's a pretty confused sea state out there. I mean, you're beginning to get out more into the ocean where the wind is actually coming from. Oh, here we go. Is this it now? We're just waiting to see what the word is. And uh, this is, uh, there's two, here they go. And I think it's going to be... No, they're taking no, no, they're like that after the tag. Boy, it's a bit of a balancing act, isn't it, between trying to get the people off, but also remember they're still racing the boats. Yeah. And, of course, Chris Nicholson has the responsibility to uh, the crew, the guests on board. In many ways, I just hope uh, they get this over and done with it. Is it a, a distraction it is a for distraction. the crew? Okay, Dean Barker there is waving the waving the chase boat in. Here goes Tony Street. Oh, that's just nicely oh, done, I Tony. <laughs> well, she'll talk about that one for a while as the life jacket uh, explodes for her, and then she'll be wait waiting for the pickup. And there's Dean Barker waiting to go. And I think uh, this will have been a unique exit off the boat for him as Tony Street's picked up. And then we'll go and see uh, what an experience to have been on board one of these boats flying around the harbour. Dean looks a little bit pensive. Um, but I think that uh, at the same time, uh, as you were saying, Peter, that, you know, he... he, he he, he in some ways wouldn't be like to get like to be going, but he knows what they're going out into, and will be probably quite happy to get off and know he's got a warm bed tonight. Famous uh, landmark of Auckland Harbour, Bean Rock Lighthouse, and uh, that lighthouse is, sits on the top of a little reef that uh, sits off St Helier's Bay. As we look at Barker, Dean Barker getting ready to jump off. OK, yes, waves yes. goodbye to the, the boys. Here he goes. Oh, nice dive. Oh, Could have done oh his hat legs, survived eh? as well. <laughs> yeah, very good. That was... Uh, we get a few marks out of ten, I think. Wasn't very, too very bad. Nice, not very nice dive. There he is. I'm amazed his hat stayed on. That's, uh, that's, that suddenly gets uh, a line thrown to him and we pulled up and ashore. And that's, uh, that'll be a unique memory, without a doubt. So we can concentrate now on uh, on where we were. OK, so I think things will settle down on the boat. That's probably been a little bit costly for them, Peter. Well, I think it has. I'm just, um, although it's amusing, uh, I do think, actually, for the team, it's probably a distraction they didn't need. 
And uh, through all that, when uh, they, they started the manoeuvre, I thought they were in third. I've got them now. They might have lost two or three spots uh, through that distraction. They had a couple of tacks to do. But up the front of the pack, it's Sanya, and they're, coming, they're still approaching. They'll be looking for a yellow marker. They'll come around that yellow marker and then head up towards the um, East Coast Bays. On board with Sanya, and again, as we say, such a familiar coastline for these guys, and uh, where they've cut their sailing teeth. There are sailing clubs all the way up in all these bays, heading up the on the left-hand side of this boat. As Sanya goes into another tack, we see the mark of the course. They're being driven up the coast, where there'll be people all the way along until they turn and head away. Uh, they're driven along the coast, uh, people from vantage points all the way along, able to watch the fleet as they as they barrel past. Martin, one observation here earlier in the race when we were in um, a fish in Cape Town and I think even in Sanya. Um, Sanya had a different Genoa. This, they had a Genoa that was quite high in the clue which is the, the intersection corner where the sail attaches to the deck. But now they've got a sail that's low on the deck. And uh, that will be a new sail that the designers have come up with. So Sanya have developed. I think they're a little bit faster than they were. And they've really capitalised in this one to leave Auckland. And they'll lead the fleet out now to sail reach up to the East Coast Bays to another turning mark. And then it's all going to be on. Mark Cavell, we're going to be closing this broadcast down shortly. Just give us your summation of, uh, of, of, of what this has been like and what they're heading into. Well, it's been a, a fantastic send-off. They've got uh, great conditions as Sanya has just got around the top mark, put the bow down and, and headed off. And they'll really just be thanking the, uh, the town, the city, for what a great reception this has been. Abu Dhabi still just on the ley line to that top mark. And it's a nice top mark for Abu Dhabi. Coming behind them will be Telefonica. So Abu Dhabi uh, come around the mark and then they'll ease sheets and head out into the Haraki Gulf. Well, what a stopover it's been here in Auckland. It's been uh, everything that they could have asked for. But perhaps it could have just been a little bit longer. The boat's delayed out of China to get down here, and uh, and it's been a very busy time. Peter, your feeling about how it's all gone? Oh, I think the Auckland stopover, you've covered a bit short, but in terms of uh, the conditions that they've had have been perfect, and lucky to get the conditions in the inner harbour, uh, and, and the send-off and the support from all in the harbour has been fantastic. OK, well, it's been a privilege to bring you this broadcast. We'll be carrying on on the internet as long as the technology will uh, allow us to keep up. And now we go back to this familiar routine where we'll be waking up in the night, thinking about these guys, wondering just how they're getting on and wondering what they're having to put up with. We know it's going to be a severe test of man and machine, and we just wish them all the very best as they head off, leaving the city of sales. Hairiba is the farewell from Auckland in New Zealand, from the city of Sales. We wish you farewell and we wish these guys fair winds and a safe sail. Okay, welcome back, all you viewers on the internet around the world. We're uh, looking at the fleet now. They've cleared the port, really, of Auckland and they can now get into a, a settling down routine and they're on their way and well what lies ahead of them 6700 miles but before that they're in for a right regular little kicking in the next couple of hours peter next 48 hours well first up yes they've got to get out of the harbor but um the first obstacle will be actually clearing the haraki gulf there's a uh, an area called the colville channel wind against tide it can be quite nasty I don't I don't imagine these boats will have too much difficulty but then they get out into the Pacific off New Zealand and the forecast is particularly nasty and it's decision time you know they've got to make some decisions do they head hard immediately south down to 
East Cape, which is another landmark of, of the North Island, or do they trek out into the Pacific uh, for different conditions? So the next scad, skids in the next, what, six hours or the next 12 hours will be interesting viewing because uh, I expect to see a split in the fleet. Mark Cavell, how do you see this, this one panning out for these guys in, in, in the next couple of days? Well, it's uh, the, the forecast, uh, certainly for tonight, uh, the next couple of days, is uh, quite a lot of breeze. But talking to some of the navigators, they said it wasn't uh, so much the, the first few days that was worrying them. It was the transition back to slightly lighter conditions and making sure that uh, they don't suffer uh, from lack of breeze. So that was what was concerning the navigators. But uh, just looking uh, off to my left as we're, we're tracking along the fleet, We've got Sanya in, 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 in the lead, who was obviously last into Auckland. And way back on, on, on behind me is Group Armour, who, uh, who was first into Auckland. So completely <laughs> reversed uh, as, they, as they left. Well, we're looking across at the sail training ship Spirit of New Zealand is that uh, square rigger in the background as uh, once upon a time a state of the art. And now these ones, uh, how different they look as well. Camper, Puma and Telefonica are all bunched in as they punch their way up the Rangitoto Channel and on towards uh, East Coast Bay. It's pretty murky out there at the moment. Yes, very murky. Uh, there's a um, there's like a mist in the air. The breeze is still up. Uh, and of course, the, the green sea is no longer green. It is just white with uh, waves made by this incredible spectator fleet. It really is incredible. There's canoes, small dinghies, launches, Bigger boats, jet skis, ferries, you name it, it's out here. Mark, how many boats do you think you've got out there oh, doing the I mean, I, I started counting and lost count as I... Uh, I mean, it, it, it's got to be a 1,000 boats. It really has. It's an incredible sight. It really is. Uh, this is the island of uh, Rangitoto, which is uh, a, a, a real icon for New Zealand because it's almost a perfect volcano and you can... It looks the same whichever way, wherever you are in the city. And uh, it's uh, it's attached to a, just to another island, the Motu Tapu. And this is the view from there. You can see the the, the, vol the volcanic look of the place. And uh, this is flying ac across. And uh, there's that spectator fleet that Mark is Mark is uh, referring to. We're looking right back from Rangitoto across the Rangitoto Channel, which is the main shipping channel leading into New Zealand, uh, into Auckland. And we're looking back now, the, the tower in the background is uh, uh, alongside one of the beaches, which is Takapuna, which uh, which has its own boating club. In fact, how, how many boating clubs would there be up there, I suppose? Uh, well, there's Takapuna, there's Milford, then we head up to... Um, before that, there's... Uh, the, uh, well, down here, Naranek. Devonport, Naranek. There's, what, there must be eight, six, six or eight along the, the bays. And, of course, in many ways, where the boats are sailing now is one of the, the nurseries for New Zealand yachting. We're sailing with uh, many of the champion sailors, especially from the Auckland area, coming from these yacht clubs along the bays, as we call it. Things are starting to settle down. We can see on board Camper. Uh, it's not as frenetic as it was. Uh, the other interesting point there, Martin, they haven't actually bothered doing their stack. Yeah, I was just thinking These that, actually. Can, I was just looking, I, I was wondering why they would have, why they would wait. Mark, why would you wait before you start uh, heaving the sails up? Because there's quite a lot of tacking to be going on yet. Well, I can tell you in one fell answer, it's such an effort to stack. It, I mean, it, it can take up to 40 minutes on a big stack. You know, you stack the food bags, you stack all the sails, and it is just simpler to be nimble on your feet and be able to tack uh, easily. And, and you don't want to be moving these sails back and forth in these close conditions you know imagine tacking round uh, spectator boats and all the marks they've had to do so get it down below get it out of the way keep it clean react to the conditions who is just be standing there while they're straining to move these sails and they're all held down with 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 truckers straps with huge ratchet straps because the water down the deck is enough to pull these sails off and cause a lot of damage so uh, the stacking is a big part for these guys it's something they really hate We've seen a few little uh, mechanisms for, for making their stacking life easier, 
Saw an interesting little gizmo on Telefonica once. Uh, a few bars across the um, the cockpit. They could slide the sails across and then uh, uh, take the bars and uh, carbon. Uh, dismantle them again so that was quite a smart little maneuver from from them very good idea you've got all the life jackets and the kit down below all the all the foul weather gear all hooked on one big line and you can pull it across with a handy billy across to one side and as i said uh, when you do a full stack it takes about 40 minutes so you don't want to be uh, uh, if you could do it more efficiently you could tack more efficiently and react to the conditions better we're gazing at the gorgeous super yacht mansion built here in New Zealand by Alloy Yachts, and it's uh, uh, very. Uh, the owner is a very proud supporter of, uh, of Emirates uh, Team New Zealand, and they use it as one of the hospitality boats. There are two imagines. One's over in Europe at the moment, and there's a lovely contrast of the old and the new as we look at the virtual vision of Rangitoto, and that's our position on the racetrack. Mark Sanderson still leading. And there's the, the square rigger spirit of New Zealand. Sort of training ship, a uh, life-changing experience. Oh, Peter, you know plenty of people who've been yeah, on there. Yeah, including, including um, one of my sons actually was privileged enough to go on spirit, and uh, it was life-changing for him. And I think it might have changed his outlook on life a little bit. And the, the people that run it, the trust that run it, I mean, Many young Kiwis uh, go through the spirit and um, they do a fabulous job of taking young Kiwis out onto the, the, the safe seas around the New Zealand and teaching them what life's about, really, and challenging them to do anything, which is, which is well, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, up on the top of one of those rigs and uh, you want to go up there? the comradeship. No, thank How would you. you no, go up no, there? Perhaps not these days. Yeah, that would be, uh, I wouldn't want anybody to have to lift me up there. So we're back now on board Abu Dhabi. Ian Walker had a, made a really nice job of uh, getting out here. They did. They certainly did. It, I thought uh, Abu Dhabi did a, a very good uh, in, import portion, as Ian Walker frequently does. But uh, this one will be about the next 48 hours, the initial period as they leave New Zealand. Just while we're here, we're looking back. Um, well, we'll, 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 we'll maybe go back and have a look at, uh, give a, a little bit of an explanation about what we're going to be seeing once they've disappeared out of sight, because they, in the old days, the boats would have just gone and we would have just had to wait till they got into Brazil to see what was going on. So we look back at spirit, but um, now, of course, with the benefit of um, all the sat amazing satellite technology, oh, a nice big wave from the crowd on the back, big crew on the back of uh, of Spirit. Well, it might be a voyage, and they go out and spend 10 days cruising around the Hariki Gulf or up to the Bay of Islands, which is beautiful. Many of these young people have not been on the ocean before, and they come from all works of life, fields, <laughs> mainly school kids. Oh, yeah. Well, they're clearly enjoying themselves. No, I'm sure they will. I mean, everybody I've met who's ever come off this says that it was literally a life-changing experience. Comradeship, great friendships made. And that's uh, what a lovely shot looking back, as you say. Older the older than you. you. Yeah. Well, I, I, I believe we uh, saw a, a glimpse of Lion uh, earlier on as well, uh, the old Whitbread. Well, we're getting a fair amount of sailing heritage chucked at us here. Well, I don't think I would uh, want to go running up the rigging on there, especially out in a, in, on a sea like this, but uh, wow, she's a solid ship, there's no doubt about that. Beautiful images, but um, we're talking about getting, you know, how the, the pictures are, we're going to get the pictures back, and uh, we've uh, been enjoying some new technology where we've been able to actually go live onto the boat and uh, do live interviews uh, with the crew. And we're hoping we might be able to do that at some stage actually in the Southern Ocean. And that would be that would be a real sight. But you can see in the background there where that sailor, the sailor big dome, the, in, the Inmar Sat dome. And uh, uh, I think that Mark Cavell, you've got a few little factoids up at your fingertips. Absolutely. I was lucky enough to be uh, on the last Volvo Ocean race as the media crew member. 
And the big game changer to modern sailing and media is really the ability to beam and satellite the, uh, the, the large files. We actually send uh, HD uh, uh, data off the boat uh, and uh, HD definition off the boat. Uh, and, it, and it just really does make a big difference to be able to see action from the boat. The other innovation is obviously making a dedicated cameraman, a media man, on board. It means that he can't uh, get involved in all the action when the action's happening. He has to film it. And then all, uh, all of that stuff is sent off using the Fleet 500, Fleet Broadband 500 from Inmarsat. And that actually sends about um, 0.5 of a megabyte per second off the boat. And something that's happening uh, over the next few years, Inmarsat is going to put up another satellite and it's going to increase the ability uh, quite considerably to something like 50 megabytes per second. So that means you can have live HD footage from the next race. Really quite incredible. You'd be able to literally turn on a, a almost like a, uh, a webcam and see the action on board any time of the day. So uh, there are lots of innovations in the air, but uh, the, the, the job of the media crew members should not go unmentioned because they really do bring this this uh, race to uh, to uh, to our to our living rooms, to our offices, and really, you know, they really do uh, uh, sh show the life on board. I think one of the really interesting points with that, uh, and, and we're, 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 we're with um, the one of the onboard cameramen here on, he, he's giving us these shots live now from his handheld, uh, his handheld camera. Um, and that's uh, Andre Soriano, Shifty is his, uh, is his nickname, there he is, giving us a bit of a wave. And I think the, uh, he's just, uh, thanks very much, uh, that's a little kiss for Mum, if she's tuned in somewhere. And uh, just to the, to the left of him is the dome, is, is the sat dome thing that, uh, and the significant point about that, one of the many significant points about it is on top of it is a camera, and this is that's the, the, the big Inmarsat dome, and then there's a camera just above it. And if there's an incident, then the media crew member, in this case Shifty, will go and he hits a switch, and there are switches positioned around the boat. And if you hit that switch, it then instantly records and locks down the four minutes, the preceding four minutes, uh, so that you know you can. You know, you get that incident. Like, you know, if, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the last time we saw that being being used, where we hit the four minutes. one. I can I can imagine and remember Mike Pameter on on Camper uh, when uh, he got washed into a wave and lost some teeth, and it was uh, it was a pretty ferocious belting that he got. And, and Hamish Hooper on Camper could hit the button wind it back and then he's captured that and then we could see exactly how poor old Mike got a bit of a whacking uh, so as we say the technology is fa is fantastic and it's really bringing the the whole of this to life and to a massive audience well Martin I uh, I used that very button in the southern ocean uh, two and a half thousand miles out to sea where we were already in 35 uh, 38 knots and uh, we saw a squall coming and uh, there was no time to shorten sail. And we just took off in, in a huge gust uh, in excess of 45 knots. We barreled down a wave too fast, stuck the nose in the wave in front. The bow went down, the stern went up, the, the, uh, the rudders came out of the water. And before we knew it, I looked at the spreader cam and the spreader cam was underwater. That's not something you often want to see because we were uh, it was the famous uh, Team Russia Chinese jive. If you want to see it, it's still on the YouTube. Uh, so Team Russia Chinese jive, and that was us on one side. And it was that technology that uh, I could film that entire uh, situation. We got some great footage off the back of the boat, and uh, I've edited it and beamed it off the boat using the MRSAT Flight 500 within an hour. And I think it was in news desks around the world showing some incredible footage from the heart of the Southern Ocean. I remember it well, and it is, uh, it is a, a very, very scary piece of footage, especially as you know you're so far away from anywhere. I mean, um, this race now will go past in the, in the Southern Ocean, go past Point Nemo, which is the most remote spot on Earth, 2,000 
miles from land in every direction. What does it feel like, uh, Mark? Well, it's a strange emotion because uh, seeing all the, specta the spectators and they can look over and see all the houses and imagine the people watching them. And then uh, it's not long before the last spectator boat leaves and you realize that you're, uh, uh, then the helicopter come and buzzes you and then the helicopter waves and then you sail for a few more days and then you realize you probably strayed off the any shipping lanes that uh, you, you might be running with and you start to see fewer and fewer uh, ships out there and then you just realize you're out there you, you know you're almost beyond uh, you know any kind of helicopter rescue uh, if a plane was going to come past it could purely just drop you something if you were in trouble and it really is that sense of loneliness and being far out and the only competitors the only sort of body of man and, 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 and anything that could come and help you are the other sailors in the race and that's uh, a, a, a real solace to know that if you were in trouble uh, that you had uh, the other boats around you that could come and uh, come and rescue you. And I, it's a statistic that I have to, uh, to check out myself, but uh, someone told me the other day that uh, when you get to that midpoint, you are closer to the NASA space station than you are to any other body of men, which is uh, really quite a, a chilling thought. And uh, the thought of being so far out, you're closer to something in space than you are on land. Well, that's... Uh... That is, um, I, I would imagine, a pretty spooky feeling. Talking of distances, uh, Mark, uh, what is it that the data that comes out of that thing is sent uh, 72,000 kilometres on a round trip in less than a second? That's right. It really is incredible how fast the, uh, uh, the data is sent up to the satellites and uh, back to HQ in Alicante. Uh, where they process it and uh, send it out and make it make all these wonderful uh, uh, images that we've been seeing. It does make you think, doesn't it? So, yeah. Seven cameras on board these boats, and uh, with, I mean they're, they're up in the rigging. There, well, there's, there's one looking back now from uh, under the boom, and you can remotely control them from inside the from the media desk. As we look at, uh, there's Amory Ross doing his work. And you can see <laughs> what a great shot from the helicopter. And uh, both hands there, and that uh, is some really nice stuff there from uh, Amory Ross, done a great job. It really has uh, revolutionised the sport, especially um, the Volvo Ocean Race, and, I, and I'm sure as sailing develops and the technology catches up really or makes it workable we're going to see technologies used for sailing to bring it more alive but the stuff that's come out or the material that's come out from the media crew members and the technology that's used to make it usable uh, I think is absolutely fantastic so the boats now are up round mark three they, that's up the east coast bays and uh, just while I was sitting here listening to you guys chat away, Martin, the, it's getting more Darling. wind. The waves are getting up. You can see the guys are starting to get uh, plenty of water over the deck as uh, Group Armour comes into Mark III. She trails that little group a little bit, but um, I, I'm sure in the context of what's going to happen in the next 20-odd days, it's going to be a big issue. But, uh, Difficult it's amazing how, that, yeah. quickly, how quickly they are into the rough water. Okay. And it's Come only on. going to get rougher as they head out towards Colville Channel yes, later in the afternoon. So we look at Group Armour coming into the Volvo Ocean Race turning mark out off. Looks like it's up by Murray's Bay to me. One of the, I think that's Dean Barker's yacht club from memory. It's where he learned the trade as... Group Armour come round and harden up. So all boats now, uh, they, they came along on a reach from the turning mark in the harbour, and now they're having to go back on the wind. They're heading up to the final mark, which is further up the coast, and then it is directly on the wind all the way across to the Colville Channel, the Coromandel Peninsula. Uh, Martin, I've sailed out there a bit and it can get quite nasty with this wind direction and later on in the day when the tide changes, they're going to have wind against tide, 
through through an area that is notorious for big seas. Not nice at all. And I think the hardest is really hard, even for really seasoned sailors. And I think you, you would you would have uh, seen this plenty of times, Mark. That that no matter how you know how good your sea legs are, the fact is is that you know it, it, your body takes a while to adjust uh, to the pounding, to this motion. And you know you've 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 you no appetite. Seasickness begins to kick in, and and it's it's not as though you get a gentle introduction on a day like this because they're just going to well you can see now they're pounding into it, and as, as Peter said it's only going to get worse. And how long would it take you to get your sea legs, Mark? Well, I'm very very lucky. I've uh, and I say this with absolute uh, caution. I have never been seasick, but I've certainly felt pretty rough. The transition from. Um, uh, land to sea is it, it, it's a baptism of fire uh, on this first night you you, uh, you often come out and there's, there's the, the day is long with the import and you finally get into the the, the the watch systems where the guys will start to disappear down to their bunk because they know that it's going to be a long old night uh, but seriously the uh, uh, you get into the conditions and uh, your, your, your body and your mind and your t and your stomach certainly tells you that you are out at sea, and this is uh, this is going to be your life for the next few weeks, and get used to it quickly. Very tough for those who are prone to seasickness. And uh, interesting, you mentioned before about you know what happens and uh, trying to repair a sail the size of a tennis court, which is exactly what happened to uh, to Camper before uh, in the in the last leg where they split their J2 and had to repair it. And I was talking to Rob Salthouse, who is uh, one of the sail makers on board the boat and he was describing what it was like and he said you know I mean he is an absolutely iron man he's an extraordinary character and he was saying that first of all they had to squirt it with some um, something to get rid of the water Peter what's the, the they had to squirt it with something that the smell was just dreadful and that got them started and uh, then they had to get the glue out and this is just the cabin was filling it with fumes and he said you know he's he's a man with a cast iron stomach and he was he was really struggling and he was working with a he was working uh, with another sail maker there um, uh, Andrew McLean whose nickname is Animal and he looked at uh, he said he looked at Animal and said uh, uh, aren't you feeling a bit crook, mate? And he said, "No, oh, I've, I've had one of the pills." <laughs> <laughs> he was. He'd, he'd got one of Nico's pills. <laughs> but, but Martin, and, and again, talking to someone like Robert Salthouse or any of the sailmakers, you know, it can take up to 12 hours for them to work in those conditions to put a sail back together, and it's vital that they do that. Because well, he said actually they were 17 hours. 17 hours. 17 hours. I mean, getting that's that amazing. Job done. And, and working in the uh, horrendous conditions. But of course, they have to do it because the performance of the boat, if they're not on the right sail. But it, uh, it I mean, costs them, cost them horrendous. You're 20, amount of 20, 20, 25 percent down on performance. And, and so, um, again, I'm, I'm one, of the, one of the good things about what we've just observed, I haven't seen any sail damage because what, what the dread is in these import. Uh, portion before they head out into the ocean as if you break anything in terms of sails and, and that was the issue at that bottom mark where they were taking those A2s off but it's getting look at as we watch each five or ten minutes it's just getting rougher and the seas getting bigger the rains coming <laughs> it's looking pretty good in here at the moment it looks really good in here at the moment that's it's getting uh, worse and worse for these these guys and uh, a very a very rugged departure. OK, this is, uh, well, I mean, it's, I think we're beginning to battle a little ourselves with the technology. I mean, this is this camera that we were talking about. Actually, when we mentioned about the, the stern camera, the last time I can remember seeing it was when the J2 did blow and uh, Hamish would have hit the button and we see them sailing along and then there's just lit this great bang. The, and the J2 had split yeah, in half. And the strop break, I think the... Well, yeah, the strop that holds, you're looking at Group Palmer now, the strop well, that holds the tap out at the corner of the sail down in the bar. And so that would have been out bow. on the bowsprit. Yeah, and it just... Uh, point, so. it, it, that gave, and and they would normally have had a, a safety strop on, that wasn't on, and it went flying up and then just ripped apart. Amazing. The, 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 they rebuilt that sail here, 25% of it they're in. allowed to replace. And we went in and watched them working on it in the sail yard.
So just looking at this, Martin, now the boats have uh, they've got up beyond that last turning mark. They're hard on the wind now, and you, you, we can see that Sanya hasn't immediately tacked, nor has Abu Dhabi. So the boats uh, are now essentially in the Hauraki Gulf. They're leaving Auckland, and uh, they're in for a torrid next uh, 48 hours, and maybe even more. OK, well, we're going to wrap this up. I'll say uh, a, a farewell from uh, from Mark Cavell. Been great having you uh, here with us, with us, Mark. Look forward to seeing you in some more of these ports. And uh, and from Peter Lester, farewell. As we're beginning to lose uh, our, lose our images and lose our links. Ah, well, there you go. <laughs> and uh, so we will say farewell as we watch the boats head out into what is going to be a very rugged time. No doubt we'll all be watching our live trackers on Volvo Ocean Race. Dot com and uh, and we'll be glued to it as they said on board this boat they know the support will be with them it's with all the fleet so from uh, Auckland uh, here arise the way we would say goodbye here farewell from Auckland from the city of sales